knew that I wanted to learn to be a leader, but I would never have said that at the time. There's something that I have to offer. Almost everyone wants a romantic sexual relationship. If you're in a bad relationship, your life can literally fall apart. And if we're gonna evolve, we need to cut that out. It's two individual and usually quite oppositional beings in nature coming together in a synergistic symphony that creates something new, right? That's complex. That's not an easy thing to do. It's like you have to practice that. I see more men showing up and the men who come are uh, so earnest. As a man, your attention and your presence is a gift. It's an asset. It's a precious commodity. Actually, I care and I want to go somewhere and I want to do something and I want to leave something behind. Welcome to the first ever episode of my new Way Showers podcast. I'm excited to have you here. And uh, the vision for this podcast is to speak with visionary leaders from around the world on the future of men and masculinity. I believe we need to have those conversations as we are trying to find our way as our existing paradigm is crumbling all around us. And in this first episode, I will be speaking with Damien Belair. Damien is an Australian man who has become quite the profound teacher of intimacy and relationships. I've loved watching his journey online over the last couple of years when he's amassed quite a big following, bringing a nuanced message on intimacy, boundaries, trauma, relationships, seduction, sexuality, so on and so forth. And I've seen Damien really make a difference in people's lives. And Damien, he actually discovered my website, MasculinityMovies.com many years ago. MasculinityMovies.com was my first foray into the men's space. And on that website, I explored popular movies through an archetypal lens. And Damien was one man who supported me with three movie reviews in that process. And since then, I have seen Damien be on quite the hero's quest to become the very inspiring teacher and man that he is today. I really enjoyed this conversation with Damien, and I pray that you find a lot of inspiration and clarity about your own way forwards. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Wayshowers podcast, Damien. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks for having me. You're my first guest. I know. I feel honored. <laughs> Glad to be here. Yeah. <laughs> we were just catching up a little bit um, before I pressed record here and um, remembering back to the first time that we met. And I think we agreed that the first time we met physically was in Boulder, Colorado, yeah, back in 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. And um, well, life has taken you some places since then. As it has you too. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. And yeah. I've, just, I've loved seeing uh, you building your platform out there and, and putting out your trainings and, um, and just becoming a very profound teacher in your own right. And uh, I see that you've gathered quite a big following by now. So whenever yeah. you put something out, like they're all, there's like a, st a stream of women feeling so seen by you and they're loving it and sharing <laughs> it. And so I need to know what happened there. Cause when I met you in Boulder, you were relationally frustrated and trying to figure mm -hmm. out this thing about intimacy. And now you seem to be the authority on the subject. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just reflecting, just as you're giving that intro, that it, it's quite interesting. We were both in Boulder at the same time, and we were both doing trainings. I mean, you were doing a longer training than me, but I, I, I do remember my intent to go over to the US was to learn and to learn to facilitate something. I didn't know what, but I knew that I wanted to learn to be a leader, but I would never have said that at the time. I would never would have said that I wanted to be a leader. I wanted to be on authority or I wanted to be a teacher, but there was definitely a calling that was pulling me that said, I need to learn how I just need to learn. I just need to learn because there's going to, there's something that I have to offer. And I just like, I knew that. And I've, I've known that for, for a long time, I think. Um, yeah. And, and intimacy has been one of the things that frustrated me my whole life. Um, mm. Some of my earliest experiences, you know, all the way back in 
um, preschool and primary school were of rejection and humiliation by girls. And I spent a long time in my shell and confused. I was very late to date. I was very late to become sexually active. It wasn't until my 20s, early 20s. Um, I feel like I knew very young that relationship was important, you know, and, and I, I, like, honestly, I feel like I knew very young that, you know, I'm, I don't know how to use the language for it because there's so much bias around all the language, but I knew that there was a spiritual dimension. I knew that there was an evolution. I knew that there was, you know, I was raised to Buddhist parents. So I was raised in a paradigm that thought of enlightenment and thought of, you know, awakening and thought of processes like that, you know, reincarnation, everything. So that was very much in my vernacular and in my, in my worldview growing up. So I knew there was like a, a, a spiritual dimension to life and there was more to life and reality than, than, than what we see. And, and, and I think I was moved not so much to the awakening path that my parents, particularly my father follows, but more to the growing up path, the, the how can I become actualized in this life versus kind of maybe escape this life or escape this reality in a way. So I'm just giving a little bit of context for my story. And I knew that somehow I knew that relationships was important. And I remember like it was like in my late teens or early 20s around that time where I like I felt this internal decision that I was like, if I wake up or if I become enlightened or if I become the most evolved being that I could be or whatever it is, I don't I didn't know the language. I want to do it with someone else. I don't want to do it on my own. I want to do it in relationship with someone else. So that was a that was something that pulled me very strongly into um, thinking about relationship. And then my my encounters all the way through my 20s were with the safe. I'd been hurt so badly by women that um, I went for safe women who were, you know, it's harsh to say, but less developed than me. So I was frustrated mm-hmm. and unmet, you know, and so there was right. a long process of that. And then so it was a long process of like developing enough self-worth and um, starting to claim what what I wanted and who I wanted to be met. And then it was a process of, you know, dating and dating and dating, you know, and kind of getting a refinement through that dating of what I wanted in relationship, you know, until I, until I met my, my current partner who I feel walks this path with me. She wants the same thing as me, you know, and we're, we're committed to relationship as a crucible. We're committed to, uh, an evolutionary path for ourselves and also relationship and in service of something beyond us. You know, we both feel committed to leaving something for our children, our children's children. You know, what is it? How do we help the world to wake up into something more, to evolve into something more? Um, so it's not just relationship for the purpose of my own gratification. It's relationship as service too. So I don't know if that fully answered, but that's kind of a, a little story of where I am where I am yeah. now. And, and on that path, I just, one, one last little thing. It's like, I seem to be someone who loves to, and I make up that you're probably quite similar. I love to, I love to understand the way things work. I, I, I love to understand the mechanics of how things work. Like what are the, what are the baseline uh, principles, structures, skill sets, developments as technologies, however you want to call it, that are ubiquitous to all of us, you know? And so I, I looked at a relationship from that, that perspective. What are the baseline things of relationship that inarguably, no matter what type of relationship you have, are, are important, you know? You can't actually function properly without them. Um, so that's kind of what's driven me. And I think that's what has given me this platform is I'm able to articulate those things quite well. Mm. Great. So I, I've noticed I spent I spent some time on your Facebook feed over the mm. the last couple of days to really get a sense for what you're up to, and um, this this idea of relationship as a crucible seems really like central to your work, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I have a sense that the kind of relationship you're talking about is is even though it's applied to all relationships, it's primarily the intimate relationship that you see as as this crucible is is that correct or how do you see it well at this point you know i I was 
touching in with you a little bit before, it's like I'm focused on relationship at this particular moment, but it's not my mm -hmm. only interest, you know, in the in the, yeah. the time period since since I I met you in Boulder, I was I've also been a permaculture teacher, you know, I went and lived on a farm for a couple of years, yeah, and I learned I permaculture design, and I started consulting and teaching for that. So, you know, it's like, and I've, I've been fascinated by community structure and organizational structures. So I don't think it's the, it's the only relationship. However, I do think it's an important relationship. I think the romantic relationship is a central relationship in the human story. Mm. It's something that almost everyone wants, whatever form they want it in, whether they want polyamorous, monogamous, same sex, whatever, it doesn't matter. Almost everyone wants a romantic sexual relationship. Yes. I, you know, and, and most people spend their time either talking about their desire for one or talking about their struggles if they're in one, you know, and it's such a <laughs> central feature. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's such a central feature of, of human life. You know, it's like yeah. most TV shows and movies are oriented around even action movies that usually have a romantic story that runs through the middle of it somehow. It's a central relationship and, and it's important, you know. And, you know, one of the things why I think it's so important is that if it, it, because it occupies so much attention and energy, if they aren't working, the amount of energy that drains from the individuals in our societies and cultures towards toxic relationships that just spill our energy out the bottom is immense. And if we're going to evolve, we need to cut that out. Like we just can't. Yeah. And you wrote something really profound on your wall mm -hmm. a few days back, something along the lines of relationships evolve when they produce more energy than they consume. Yeah. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. 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 I don't, and it's until we get yeah. to that point, you know, it's, well, it's until we get to that point where we're actually like, if relationship becomes a crucible and a sanctity and a sanctuary for our individual soul to flourish, mm. then we actually start consume, like producing energy. From a relationship we actually the individuals become more empowered you know they become more powerful they become more powerful agents in the world you know and that's i think where we where we start to touch points especially you and i with the, with the premise of this podcast and the work you're doing and i doing is it's like how do we become powerful agents in this world mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's a nice segue to men and masculinity yeah um do you find that you have more women in your work or do you find a lot of men come towards you as well? It's more women, but the amount of men are increasing. Mm -hmm. There are more men showing up. There are, there are definitely, you know, when I started two years ago, kind of by accident, that's a whole different story. Um, predominantly women, but I would say the percentage, you know, it's probably like 85% women. And I'd say it's probably 60% women now, you know, it's like, mm. there's actually been a significant shift. I see more men showing up. I see more men following me. I see more men commenting and liking. Um, I see more men showing up to the workshops and the courses that I run. Um, and the men who come are so earnest, mm. like it's beautiful. It touches me. You know, one of the, the flagship courses I have is about teaching authentic relating skills. You know, it's, this is a background that you and I share. And the men who show up to these courses are so earnest, like it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And as you are with them, it was 40% now that's, a, that's a very good ratio in my experience in the personal development field. Yeah. I would have guessed more like 2080, but, yeah. uh, but things are changing. I agree with that. Um, yeah. what are you finding? what what are the ways that they're like wounded and what are the challenges that they're facing as men in 2023 it's an interesting one cuz you know cuz i think the i think the positioning that i've put myself in has is having me attract a certain type of people in a certain context right. so um i feel like i'm i'm positioning myself as someone who's offering a little bit more complexity. I'm not offering, you know, I've been lately, I've been positioning myself as for those in, for those evolving beyond the fantasy is kind of like one of the mm. positioning statements I've been using. Mm. And I'm like kind of offering a rhetoric that is, you know, n n not 
composed of soulmate, spiritual twin flame, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. And is has a more pragmatic, yeah, yeah, and has a more pragmatic nature to it. But I'm like trying to not lose the spiritual essence of it at the same time, which is a fine balance to to play with. And, you know, I'm I, honestly, I'm finding the men who come, like if I reflect on them, you know, they're carrying... It's an interesting question because I'm like, I'm, I'm feeling more the earnestness and the eagerness than I am the wounds, which is not That's something amazing. I would have expected a while ago. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm feeling the, that like, there's a hunger, a hunger to learn and grow and to understand. And it's like, it's almost like there's a sense that women have some magical language. And then these men are just like, I want to understand what the hell this is yeah. and embody it, you know? And there's like, so is that their main yearning you find to be able to parse out what is happening in the in the woman's experience or in the feminine experience? I would have said a while ago, yes, but but no, I would say there's you know, and I'm putting I'm putting words out based on what I've said. I don't have mm -hmm. direct statements or quotes. And these are these are interesting questions and I really like them. Um and I'm curious about your experience with the men you work with too. Maybe mm -hmm. we can we can compare. Um I don't, I would have said, you know, because my orientation has been like, how do I figure out how to relate to women? That's been the the personal development journey that I've been on. And I think for some people that's true, but I think I actually seem to feel like there's more an intrinsic self-motivated. Like, it's like, I just want to grow because I want to grow. You know, like, I feel like that's, that's becoming louder. It's like, that's there's really an imperative. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what I, I, that's what I feel. This sense of like, there's an imperative desire to grow because it makes sense. Yeah, you know, it's it's one of the things that makes sense, and 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 there might not even be a, a a cognitive rational understanding of why it makes sense, but it makes sense that I should grow, you know. Right, and so then the crucible that you happen to to teach and be a steward of, in a way, it just happens to be the the place where they have chosen to do their work. But it's not so much that it's all about women and sex and intimacy. They just want to grow within any kind of crucible is is that how you're experiencing it or well so so that's an interesting question because the the the, the courses that i've done up until now i'm only now directly starting to directly i've only now done my very first workshop that has been directly focused on you know uh romantic sexual intimacy until then mm. it has been stuff that is actually more generic because I'm, I've actually been been attempting to to put down, you know, there's a there's a strategy what to what I'm doing. I'm like I've been trying to put down fund foundational building blocks for this intimacy, and the the foundational building blocks are, are generic, meaning that you know authentic relating is a skill set that applies as equally valid to romantic relationships as it does family or work or friendships. It doesn't the same skill set yeah. applies across the board, you know, and and you can you can learn it. It doesn't you can go through the avenue of romantic relationships, but it's the same thing. You're just kind of tweaking the language a little bit and adding sex and romance into the mix, you know, <laughs> but other than that, it's, it's kind of the same. And, and then I've taught courses on nervous system regulation from the, and one of the premises that I offer is it's like, if you're going to have a relationship, you have to learn how to regulate your nervous system. If you're going to heal your attachment wounds, which is how you're going to have a relationship that's going to last without destroying yourself. You have to learn to regulate your nervous system and master it. But again, it's generic, you know, you, the, the triggers you receive at work from your boss disapproving of what you what you do is going to be the same thing that will activate you when your partner disapproves of what you do. You know, it's like the right. same activation sequence, you know, and then there's same with boundaries. So I'm only now starting to directly present intimacy, you know, and that's what this year is about. This year and the next year, like I've kind of been more generic and this year and the next year I'm moving into actually, now I'm taking a more direct stand for I'm promoting intimacy but the the marketing has been directed towards that so i've had people a lot of people coming from that angle so i would say most people are coming from that angle but i can't say that it's only about women mm. Mm. yeah i'd love to linger a little bit on the topic of the nervous system mm. i see that there's a general increase in awareness of the importance of addressing this there's a lot of people talking mm -hmm. about it. I talk about it in within my own work. One of the concepts that I have is to clear the chalice, which is you, you have all of this 
energy and emotion that's not necessarily even yours, but you just happen to be a vessel that carries them around. And yeah. without clearing them out, you just become this amalgamation of every every other person's you know, deposits in your life and you completely lose access to who you are and where you're going. And yeah. I think a lot of the time where... And I've been working with men for almost a decade. And, and I think emotional intensity is the thing that takes a lot of us out of the game. And it's certainly true for me as well. It's like that is the thing that gets me up in my head. So if there's a lot of intense intensity in the in the relational space, it's like, boop. you know, the, the classical way that we men respond to something like that, that is we dissociate into logic and reason, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But there is a way, and this is, of course, the sort of the, the classic trope, uh, like the David Data, you know, you be the rock in the storm and all of that. We've heard it before. But there's something here that whether you're some sort of stoic man that is completely like welded shut, you know, you just, there's just no <laughs> opening uh -huh. or you're just this flow boy that is just like, Ah, you know, this it's, it seems to be the same kind of dynamic that I don't know how to be with the intensity in my nervous system. So I just have different strategies for how to to um, tr try and regulate or defend myself against the intensity of my experience. So yeah. seeing seeing the men in your work, seeing their nervous systems and the kind of yearnings that they have. What what do you see as important for us in as men to to really further master our way that that we be with this part of our lives? Yeah, it's it's interesting that you talk about um, the the clearing the chalice. It's like I have my own my own frame that that speaks to something very similar. You know, I mm. I, I tend I've tend to have addressed it through the the lens of psychotherapeutic kind of angle and understanding you know, dysregulation and the effects on the limbic system, the amygdala and, you know, what, what that actually occurs in us. And, and I've, I've kind of been defining and thinking of trauma as actually just trapped tension in the body. It's just unprocessed tension in our body that we haven't cleared, you know, and what happens is, you know, obviously then your woman brings some intensity or something happens and you go into a triggered state and you, you might dissociate or you go into rage and anger or, you know, whatever reactive pattern in, in a recent course, I kind of defined, um, eight different kind of dis major dysregulation patterns that we might go into. And one of them is definitely the dissociation into the head, the mentalist, I call it, you know, and then we like defend with our mind. But then, you know, there are other, other responses as well. Like I've classically gone into freeze, you know, where I'm actually like sometimes fight, but sometimes a lot of freeze where I'm actually like, I kind of collapse inwards and I go in, mm -hmm. I've gone into a bit of a victim state when getting too much intensity. I, I curl up into more of a victim state, um, mm. you know, and this is, probably in response to a lot of bullying when I was young, you know, and, and not knowing how to handle aggression being taught by a Buddhist father. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. The story doesn't actually matter. Um, but it's really interesting because it's like, as we, as we learn to regulate ourselves, you know, and this is why I think of working with our attachment, working with our nervous system, working at that level is actually essential before we can truly enter a crucible and we can, we can truly start to do some of the deeper work. Cause this is the thing that's going to mess us up over and over again. This is the thing that's going to take us, take us out and take us into relationships that are consuming energy because we're spending all our time dealing with our fights and our conflicts and everything yeah. that's going wrong that we've got no energy to put the rest of our life and you yeah. know you be in a bad if you're in a bad relationship your life can literally fall apart like literally can fall apart from a bad relationship yes. so you know it's like and that's that's the trauma that's the the dysregulation in the nervous system um but one of the frames that i've been you know it's like it's like like I'd like to bring an angle in here of of if we're if we're moving to to the 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 evolved man or however we want to define the man that we're we're talking about the masculine of the future and we're talking about that man in the crucible of relationship which is kind of where my work is right now it's like my work is relationship so I'm considering the man or the masculine in the pre in the context of relationship with a woman is my focus just because I'm heterosexual, you know, it's like, that's, that's the world that I know. Um, mm -hmm. One of the frames that I've been really enjoying and I've kind of put together is the notion of purity and capacity. 
purity being a feminine principle of romantic sexual relating and capacity being a masculine um, principle mm -hmm. and capacity is the ability to handle intensity. And this is the, this is the David data frame that you talk about, you know, be the pillar or the rock or whatever. Um, and it's, it's in my experience, it comes post feeling post that ability to experience emotion, run through that, through the body, you know, when men have done enough of their grief work and enough of their crying and enough of their rage work and their anger and their guilt and their shame. And they've kind of moved a lot of that stuff. So they've actually, there's enough space in the body to feel stuff. Then we actually start being able to respond in relationship in an entirely different way. You know, mm -hmm. it's like the first, the first times in my own relationship where I, my woman is spinning, you know, she's, something has upset her and she's spinning and she's like gearing up for a fight and she's like, you know, getting, and I just like walk over in silence and just hold her in my arms and she tries to push me away and I just hold her. And then she like cracks and starts crying and then melts into me. You know, it's like, mm. that's the kind of feeling because it's, and, and that's only available because I've learned to handle the intensity in my own body. That's like, Oh, I can now actually move in this way that, when data presents it, it's like this concept that's just so far away from like, what be the mountain? Like, it sounds a bit mythical, like something from yeah. Greek mythology or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'm starting to like, see that it's, that's real. It's a real way of being, but it, there's a, there's a, there's a set of pragmatic, and this is again, my kind of orientation. There's a set, set of pragmatic steps that we need to develop to actually get yes. that capacity to be able to do that. And so the first step is to really clear out your own stuff, the things that get in the way of feeling yourself. And only when yeah. you have the foundation of feeling self, you can actually in invite other. That's what you're yeah. saying. And it's I both, think. it's both, it's both, it's like, you know, it's, it, it's more, it's part of it is clearing out our old stuff, our backlog mm -hmm. of unprocessed trauma or tension or whatever. Part of it is learning to actually regulate our own nervous system or manage our own emotional state. You know, they're kind of different. When we when we remove the backlog, the regulation becomes easier. You know, yeah. But learning that's also a principle, and then also understanding the reactive patterns. Can I can I have enough self reflective awareness that I see the way that I react, and I'm like, oh, I know how I react, which means that I'm able to take witness consciousness. You know, have I'm able to develop enough witness consciousness that I can see myself. She's getting upset. I can see the 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 victim or the accuser or the you know the the see myself and I can see myself dissociating in the moment. I'm like, okay, I can see that happening, regulate my nervous system. I can make a different choice now. And then right. I have access to something else. Yeah. Yeah. In a moment, I'd love to move us towards the more visionary aspect of the conversation, but I want to stay here with you a little bit longer because I think yeah. all men, or at least most men have been in the situation that you described that the relationship actually takes more energy than it uh, than it gives and this is also something you know i i work with many men in my own memberships and membership crucibles and and some men are struggling with their sex life their their wife is shut down it's hard for him to move towards her because she just shuts down immediately because she thinks that he wants something from her but then there's the other side of things where it's not so much a freeze or, or a flight in the relationship, but it's more explosive and there's just a lot of drama and there may be illness involved and all kinds of things. And so I am with these men and I've, I've been in relationships like this myself. And there's this constant inquiry, uh, how much work, do you accept to do before it's too much? Yeah. 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 Like so how do, how, do, how, do, how does a man know when it actually know actually it's a no. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a great question. I kind of want to like, I want to answer that by putting, I'm going to answer that by answering a question you didn't ask as well. Okay. So I'm gonna like, yeah, kind of want to, because what just what what I heard you what what I had heard you I mean I didn't hear you but but a question that I heard and I quite liked that I also want to speak to is like how much work do you have to do to have this kind of relationship 
you know that's a separate question but i kind of want to address that and then answer this question. Yeah. you know and then and i heard that and i heard this voice in my head it's like well do you want to be a virtuoso or do you want to fucking just play the ukulele really badly you know it's like what do you do you, do you want to be a master you know do you want to be a master of you know, someone who wants to be able to play and freestyle music, you know, and be taken to that timeless, elegant space, which I imagine if you're really good at music, you get into a jam with other people and you are, you, you touch God, right? You, you, mm. you are in flow state, right? To get to that, you re how much practice does that require? Well, relationship is the same thing. It's, it's, it's something, and we take it for granted. You just have a relationship and bumble along, but it's actually like personal development, it's a skill. It's like, like enlightenment. It's a, it's a thing that we have to practice like awakening. It's like, yeah. like anything, any aspect of life, it's something that we have to practice. And if we want a relationship that is, is elegant, you know, and one of the, I love the word elegance. And I think of, I, I always think of a snowboarder when I think of elef elegance, you think of a pro snowboarder and he like, he's carving down this hill and he hits, hits a ramp and he just spins his body in air effortlessly lands and keeps going. And I remember when I was young, I used to watch skateboard videos and I'd watch these pro skateboarders just, just look like they were dancing and I'd watch it and go, that's easy. I can do that. And I get on my skateboard and go skating and I just fall over and I just like, I can't do that. And that's elegance to me. It's like when you're, when you're so good at something that you make something really complex look easy. Yes. And it's like, we can have elegant relationships, which means that we can have relationships that are so incredibly beautiful that people look at them, people look at us, at, at you in a relationship and go, wow, how do you, how are you just so at ease with each other and you make each yeah. other thrive? Of course, yeah. you've made something, a relationship is an incredibly complex process. Mm -hmm. It's two individual and usually quite oppositional beings in nature coming together in a synergistic symphony that creates something new, right? That's complex. That's not an easy thing to do. It's like, you have to practice that. So, that's kind of one thing. And then it's like, well, okay, I, if, if you want that, if you're a man that wants that, if you're a woman as well, if you're a man that wants that and you go like, that's actually what I want, that's the kind of relationship that I want, right? But I'm not experiencing that. I'm experiencing a relationship that is volatile or it's shut down or I'm working really hard to try and have this woman open up or like I'm pouring my, I'm, I'm doing my work and nothing's changing or it's hurting too much. It's like, well, how much is too much of that? That's a great question, you know? And again, you know, like a kind of a pragmatic way I like to think of, it's like, it's almost like put a timer on it, you know, three months or six months. And the first question I ask is, is my partner as invested as me? You know, if I want to have an evolutionary elegant relationship, does my partner want it too? Like mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the most simple question. If it's a no, well, good luck it's it's never going to get where you want it it's like relationship relationship is a duet you don't get good at partner dance by dancing with someone who doesn't want to dance you just yeah. you can't do it you know so this is a difficult do they want one that? yeah this is that the difficult place one where a man that place where a man or a woman has like an individual awakening or some sort of uh yeah some sort of life crisis that takes them yeah. into an an inquiry where like, no, actually, I don't think the way that I'm living my life works. And now I want something different. And then the wife or the husband or whoever is just continuing to live their life as if nothing's happened. And, and that's that place is like, okay, can I enroll this person into this new adventure that I'm on? Or yeah. am I going to basically outgrow the, the relationship contract? Yeah. And that's a really hard position to be in, right? It's like, you have to ask mm. yourself some really hard questions, especially if you're invested and you have family and kids, you know, it's like, what do you do then? You know? And, yeah. and that's why it's like, you have to, you have to look at it over a period of time. It's like six months, a year, you know, if you've got, if you've got family and, you know, if you've got kids together and you've been together for 10 years or something, you've had this awakening process and you're like, I want more. And my partner doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about. My partner is completely yeah. like, what, you, you've gone mad. It's like, <laughs> okay. Can you just stop with okay. this spiritual yeah. move? What, that what is this? Why are you, yeah. what, you don't need to go to another men's retreat. What the hell is this? Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, to me, it's like, give it some time, you know, like a year perhaps and make it very clear to your partner that this isn't a phase. This is something that I want and need for my life. 
and I want to invite you into it. Not I'm going to shame you if you don't do it. Not I'm going to force you. Not I'm going to manipulate you. I'm going to invite you. It's like, I yeah. want to go deeper. I want to go deeper with you. Will you come with me? And extend that invitation. And people are going to take time. You know, if someone hasn't had that, they're going to take some time. I actually just, I recently ran a, a mini retreat at my place a few weeks ago. And there was a man who showed up. I just want to tell this story because it's actually an example of this. It's like, it's, mm -hmm. it's stunning, actually. I was like, just in awe. This man had, <laughs> I asked him at the retreat, you know, how did you find out about this? Because this was the odd, this was the odd couple out. They didn't fit in. The rest of the people there had done heaps of personal development work. And these people were just not, you know, and I asked him, how did you find out about this? And he's like, I go on Facebook and I re I'm part of a sailing club and I read posts in the sailing group and your posts. And he's like, I don't even understand what you're writing about, but I just can't stop reading them. I don't even know what you, I just read wow. them over and over again. And I don't know what you're talking about, but I, it's like, I want to know. And so he lives a few hours away from here and just signed up for this, uh, for, signed up for this retreat. Um, and he was telling me that he's, he was sitting at his computer and his, his wife was on the phone. So they've had, they've had kids and the kids have grown up and left. And his wife was on the phone with his mum arranging a dinner for the Saturday night where the retreat would be. And she gets off the phone and he's like, I think I want to go to this. I don't want to have dinner with my mom. I want to go to this. And she's like, oh, is that, is that going to be something we're going to go to together? And he's like, yeah, sure. Why not? And she's like, okay, I'll come along. And so she came along and she's, she's never done any personal development work ever. Nothing, right? This guy had... Like he came to this retreat and he's obviously in, he's in a cracking phase. He's in that phase where I'm shifting and he had like a meltdown, you know, on day three of the retreat, he, he couldn't even come up for the first half. And he, my, my partner like sat with him outside and he was wailing and going through some kind of shamanistic process of just like stuff was moving him and his wife, his wife's in the room with us and she's having a jolly good time, you know? And at the end of the retreat, it was just a two and a half day retreat. You know, we do a checkout and invite and she, and her checkout, what she, her biggest takeaway, she's like, I just touched some part of me that I didn't even know existed. And I'm really excited to explore more, you know? And I was like, that's incredible. Right? So she didn't know. She didn't know until she had the opportunity to experience it. So if someone hasn't done any of this work, they don't even know any of this exists. Right? <laughs> But that doesn't mean that they, you touch it. And that first point is beautiful because she hasn't touched the, 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 the horrible hard stuff yet, you know? Yeah. But that doesn't mean, you know, so there's an invitation and then, and then, but it then, so that's one, one side. And then just the other side is like, say I'm in a toxic relationship. This is a relationship where I've had an awakening and my partner isn't, you know, it's like, how do I invite them in? It's like, Depending on how long you've been together, give it an appropriate time span, a year or a year and a half or two years, then I'm going to keep doing this work and I'm going to keep inviting them. And after that period of time, if they're still just a no, that's when you have the hard contemplation of like, maybe if this is, if I'm serious and I want this for my life, maybe I, this is where we have to part ways and that's yeah. okay. Yeah. You know, relationships outgrow each other. That's so fine. You know, and then the other side is if it's a toxic relationship and this one is much shorter to share. Similarly, I'd give it a period of time, three months, six months, you know, nine months and be like, after six months, you know, I'm in this relationship where I really love this person and, and, but we're just fighting and it's just hard and we're just grinding each other and it's wearing at me. After six months, is the quality of my life worse or better? And if it's consistently worse, that's, that's, that's a sign, you know, if, if six months as a median, you know, as a median for that six months, my quality of life has gone down. It's like, that's that's time to consider that this is not going to be where you're going to find your grace. Maybe longer if you're really invested, nine months or a year. But again, you know, we have to give time and space and then ask those hard questions. Yeah. yeah. I love imagining this couple. It's like yeah. they just walked, walked in from the street and just like, oh, what's going yeah. on here then? Like, can we join? Mm -hmm. And then actually mm -hmm. finding a big value from it. Yeah. Good story. I'm glad you share that. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's a lovely story. I was just like, wow, this is, this is so fun. They were, they were fun. They were like such a beautiful couple, you know? Yeah. I remember I had a, 
Um, we were featured with a retreat we did back in 2019. It was the, the most badass retreat we ever hosted. And the last one I hosted because COVID came and everything. But we did this Kings yeah. of the North retreat in the Norwegian mountains. Yeah. And saw that. men flew in from the whole world. And one, the, um, one of the big television channels came and made a documentary there. And and we were featured in, on primetime television to, I guess... Mm -hmm half a million people or something like that. And um, strangely, we only got two requests after that. I was like blown away that we wouldn't get more interest. But what <laughs> one guy was really interested. <laughs> this is this is a story that is leaning a little bit uh, to, to the more negative end of the spectrum than the one you just shared. But he really wanted to go. But in the end, he's like, no, no, I can't. Because... Um, my wife just told me that she's going to take away my motorcycle if I come. So, <laughs> so, so, so this was a guy that was also just like, um, he was clearly in not that, not a very healthy relationship. And there were all kinds of power struggles yeah. there, but they were very normal people. And he had felt something yeah. there that he really wanted, yeah. but he was still yeah. locked into a toxic dynamic. So she's like, no, you're not gonna do that. I'll take your bike. You know, I, I was just blown <laughs> away when 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 that uh, that came up. Like, okay, right, that is probably yeah. why you should come. <laughs> but yeah, but fair play. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, we find ourselves in all kinds of wild relationship dynamics. But yes, there is a way to make them elegant, graceful, to to be so harmonious and loving and nurturing and giving that we actually become sources of inspiration for other people around you us yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's a beautiful vision and um i guess as we as we turn our gaze a bit towards the path forwards we're like been a bit in, di in diagnosis mode now looking at what's happening right now there's some positive trends with men and i think there's still this theme that we don't quite know where we're headed. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think humanity knows where it's headed, but I think it's certainly true for men. Yeah. Um, and as, as, as you men watching this, you're, you're contemplating that question with me is like, where are we headed? Hmm. What defines a, positive, empowered, thriving life for a man in 2023 and beyond. I think that's, um, that's something that I want to, to give to you and see where you can, this is of course, I'm not expecting you to give us like the, the pearly gates opening, hallelujah choir, everything is sorted out kind of answer, <laughs> but, yeah. but, but it's worth, it's worth going there, I think. So what do you see? Yeah. I mean, one of the big one of the big frames that I hold, you know, that, that's gonna contextualize the answer that I give is I, I honestly believe, and I've thought this for thought this for probably around 15 years ago, this this idea started formulating. And I've seen more and more evidence, you know, in in different places than I ever expected I would, is that I, I actually believe we're heading for the next bifurcation in the human species. You know, and a, a bifurcation is an evolutionary split where where a species takes two evolutionary paths, um, and this is, you know, and there's there's no reason why this wouldn't happen. This is what's happened for in all of evolutionary history for every animal on the damn planet it has gone through a sequence. You know, we have these for anyone who remembers doing evolutionary biology when you look at you know the way that you know we have these branching phyla trees that show how species developed from root ancestors and there's all these different pathways that they developed through to occupy different niches in the environment you know and mm -hmm. we're in this interesting place because we're a, we're a conscious species and we're not so much like the 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 biological adaptations that we're encountering are largely ones that are conforming to a man-made environment rather than the pressures of a of an of a, of a, of a natural environment um, mm. so I think the bifurcation will, will come in, in a, in a, in a different way. And I actually think that, I think we're, we're heading towards a bifurcation where one, one, one branch is actually heading into 
what I think of as more density. It's heading into virtual reality. It's heading into AI powered worlds. It's heading into, you know, we see this trend, for example, I've, I was watching this video the other day of like filters, you know, Instagram, TikTok filters that people yeah, are using. Sure. And there are, there are women now who go to plastic surgeons and say, please make me look like the filter, right? It's a very easy leap to go, well, when you have an, a virtual reality where you can look like that filter all the time, would you choose to be there if that's kind of where your value sits inside of you, right? Yeah. And I do think that, you know, and, and there are the first inklings of uh, babies that can be grown ex utero, you know, out of the, out of, out of the womb, you know, this is, this is coming, right? They can do this. And so there's no reason to, to extrapolate why we wouldn't have, you know, some version of the matrix as a reality where there's a virtual reality or an augmented reality that, that humanity gets plugged into and only sees the, the designed constructed nature, which I, you know, in some ways I think we're already in a matrix, but, you know, to go a deeper level, you know, it's like the, like inception to go another layer down into the dream. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I think that there is a strong yearning and hunger in a lot of people in the world for something different. Mm -hmm. There is a yearning for tribe, for community, for nature, for communing with nature. And there are movements towards that. There are, you know, I read recently an article by Charles Eisenstein, who has decided to invest in um, an eco village, an eco villa that is being constructed in Costa Rica, really elaborate. And he's, it was putting a call out for people like come and live in community. And I know other people around the world who are starting to go, we're going to put community on the land and we're going to try and do this community based living that that is a dream that is a yearning that is sitting inside of so many hearts. Like so many people that I speak to have the same thing. You know, it often shows up as some kind of like, I want to get land and have a retreat center. You know, that's often how it manifests. But I think that that that's actually the yearning to be on the land in community on in tribe, you know? And I think the bifurcation is one bifurcation is where we actually go into a technologically dominated world, you know, and where we actually sit inside of it. You know, and it, it constructs yeah. the world for us. And another one is where we actually take more ownership over our role in the world. Where I, I wouldn't imagine we wouldn't use, you know, technology. I can imagine 3D printers being an incredible asset, you know, for tool making in a, in a, in a, in a community that's moving towards agrarian roots, but without, you know, throwing everything out, without going Amish style, right? Yeah. You know, 3D printers and technology and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, th I think that that split is occurring, you know, and obviously I'm, I'm biased and interested in being on the land, being in community, being in tribe. And so I was just setting that up because I think that if that's the direction that we're heading or that's the direction that I want to head and that's the direction that I make up, you know, from what I know that we've touched that you're heading as well. And oh, for sure. I mean, we live on a farm yeah. now and, and, and the countryside. So amazing. Yeah, 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 exactly, right? And I imagine a lot of the people who are drawn to listening to this are either heading that way or kind of like that that's sitting inside as an itch because I think that is the talos. I think that is what's pulling us now. There is a need to, you know, I'm gonna throw, I said I wouldn't do this, but I'm going to throw out in a, a spiral dynamics, you know, <laughs> context for a moment. <laughs> doesn't matter anyone who wants to look up spiral dynamics and levels of consciousness turquoise consciousness turquoise consciousness being a stage of consciousness that is actually like a higher octave of the tribe mm. you know it's a tribe 2.0 is one way that i envision you know we're actually moving i believe we're moving towards tribal culture again but it's a higher octave it's no longer tribal culture that's rooted in how do we survive in a challenging and hostile physical environment, which is where the original tribes came from. It's like, how do we thrive in an integrated, you know, collaborative form where we balance, you know, and I think this is critical that, that the original tribe didn't have, where we balance the sovereignty of the individual and the collective. How do we actually resolve the tension between the individual and the collective, I think is yeah. probably one of the big, biggest problems we're going to face. I mean, this has been yeah. this has been the 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 big theme in the COVID uh, era. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. majority has agreed to surrender their sovereignty for for the supposed safety of the collective. Exactly, exactly. And 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 so I I, I 
any hypothesis I make about masculinity sits in sits inside of that notion, yeah. you know, and and taking the the relational lens that I've been taking for this particular moment sits inside of a crucible of relationship. So, you know, I, I get really fascinated by relationship because it's almost like a whole on another introducing another complex term, a whole on being something that is simultaneously a whole and a part, um, you know, an individual is a whole on, you know, I'm, I'm whole unto myself, but I'm also, I'm talking about social whole ons here. I'm also part of, you know, if I'm in a relationship, I'm a whole individual self and I'm part of this relationship entity that is me and my partner, you know, and we create a third, we create two to come together. And then there's three, one plus one equals three when it comes to relationship, mm -hmm. you know? And so, so there's a third entity and that's the first layer of social whole on, right? And that is actually, I believe the relationship is the pillar of the tribe because the relationship is where family comes out of. You know, if you look yeah. at, you look at successful communities, they're usually family oriented. Doesn't, I, I imagine it's collectives of family. So, you know, now we have one family who is somewhat integrated, who is generative. We have a couple that where the man and the woman have managed to work together enough to create and generate more energy than they consume, meaning they're thriving. And you get that couple to hang out with other couples. You know, now you get a bunch of couples and some singles and, you know, it's not all everyone, you must be in a couple or whatever, but I do think that there's a, there's a pillar structure when you have a couple and they're in a crucible and they have a, you know, not necessarily, they don't have to be monogamous can do whatever you want, but it's like they have an agreement towards each other. You have a foundational point of which there's stability. And mm. I think when you have a number of these gathered together, we start to have a community. We start yeah. to have enough for family units to occur, which means the next generation has space to interact and breed together and, and create the next generation, right? So we have this unfolding. So man becomes important inside of the relationship. And then there's also a, a, a next layer, which is important inside of the tribe, you know, and that's an interesting thing to contemplate. Yeah, let's, let's look at that a little. Right. I mean, there's a vision for, um, for more community, more tribe. But do you see a unique gendered expression for the man's role in this future vision? So I think that developmentally, when we become more integral, integrated, oh. we be our po like the, the, the gender position becomes fluid, but not in the way that people describe gender fluidity. The way that people describe gender fluidity in post postmodern is is usually like I don't want to ascribe to any gender, and so I'm gonna like kind of be an amorphous, kind of asexual, you know, um, blob of non-defining characteristics, right? Yeah. Kind of neutral, right? Yeah. You know, this is my fluidity. I'm going to kind of not really be any of it. I'm not really going to take a claim. I think as we move to a more integral stage, we have a gender fluidity, which means that I can be any of it. You know, I can, I can feel as deeply as a woman if I need to, and I can be as present as a man, you know, it's as in the deep masculine and we have access to the spectrum, which means I understand woman. You know, if I, if I've worked with my own inner feminine and I've learned how to feel and everything, now I understand woman, right. Which means that I can now choose to hold whatever traits are comfortable and 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 i think that masculine feminine no longer becomes a you know and there's like so much claim and this is this is really interesting in the postmodernism because they're not quite integral in thinking they're not quite integrated in their thinking but they have a lot the roots of a lot of really important concepts i think mm. right mm. and they they question the gender binary right and i think it's because because it's it's not a binary right but it becomes an explosion of expression you know, it becomes an explosion of unique sets of characteristics. And I'm, I sit inside of a man body, so I'm going to mostly exhibit masculine characteristics because I run on testosterone and testosterone is the energy of the masculine. Yeah, so like the biology the certainly has, a, has an impact Without doubt, here, right? Yeah. Without doubt. But then I have, you know, because I'm a... I'm a complex being, I have access to a whole host of different ways of being. So I have, you know, we have this explosion of, of characteristics and qualities, and we have a spectrum, not a binary, a spectrum, but not a spectrum necessarily in the same way. It's might be like 
you know, I'm masculine oriented, but I feel really deeply in certain ways, but it doesn't mean that I start acting like a woman, you know, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so I think that, and, and if we're moving into this kind of like tribal or integral tribe 2.0 culture, we're going to have, we're going to see space for the individual to like the the summarizing statement that I like to think of it is is I think it's a tribe the tribe put two point eight is a collective of highly individuated beings mm -hmm. you know that's that that's a sentence that summarizes that tension we're deeply individuated like I'm so individuated to the fact that I'm just a unique expression of Damien one of a kind in my unique masculine in expression my unique set of gifts my unique set of interests. There is no other piece like me in the tribe, you know, and we don't have a culture that allows this. You're, you're defined by your job role, for example. Um, and so everyone's like that. And yet we function as a collective. Mm -hmm. So that's really unique. And we don't have models of that in nature, right? Because the ants is the ant model, which is a really deeply collective model is homogenous. There's a lot of homogeneity there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It is, and, uh, it is a paradigm shift for sure. Yeah, you know, and it's a, it's a really complex, it becomes really, like that is a complex thing to be able to hold. You're so radically different than me and you and occu you occupy an entirely different role inside of the tribe than I do. And yet you your contribution to the tribe, to the thing, the organism that we all exist inside of, it serves me. It's almost like the relationship becomes less about me to you. It's like me to the tribe and the tribe to me. You know, yeah. that's our relationship. It's vertical. Versus right. horizontal and transactional. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so you, you go for it. You, for, if you want to. <laughs> well, you, had, you had, you were on a roll. I'll let you finish it. <laughs> um, so when we have that ability to hold individuation so deeply and, mm -hmm. and reverently, you know, that I, I imagine a deep reverence for the unique essence that each being holds, you know, you, you reverence for each unique being's personal, inspirationally guided contribution to the whole. You know, a bit utopian and idealistic, but I've I've started to have enough of a taste in relationship of what's possible to know. Like, right. even though it's speculative hypothesis, I believe that, you know, and it's going to have all its pitfalls and problems. I do believe that there's, you know, there's something there. You know, I think we have been. Uh sort of clumsily trying to move into this paradigm yeah. and frame for, for a while. And that there is this yearning, I think, deep in, like this mythic yearning for something akin to a golden age that yeah. that is quite similar in expression to what you're talking about. So yeah. it's like we're we're remembering the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. And I love that. I love that phrase because I feel like that's like it's like the future sends echoes back in time to touch us so that we know where to go. Right, right, and that yeah. at the same time there is this there is this um, gravitational pull into the status quo. Like for instance, people yeah. that work in with change a changing organization and maybe trying to implement you know, self organizing organizational structures and things like that including myself as an entrepreneur with a team, you know, it's, it's not necessarily easy. And especially <laughs> since so many of the holons inside of that greater holon of the organization, so many of the people kind of like following orders. And yeah. when you give them the option to actually become sovereign within the organization, that's a burden more than a freedom. Like yeah, so, yeah. so it's like we're we're on the cusp of a critical mass, feeling that yeah. to be more of a freedom, and that we have enough structures, enough tried and proven structures to facilitate it, and enough yeah. leaders that also has enough internalized trust, and and a surrender, and you know, especially when you're running a small organization like I have been doing, it's not necessarily easy to give away my baby to be cultivated by somebody who didn't actually nurse it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. it's it's a complex it's a complex um, landscape we find ourselves in as we're like leaning into this, and then wondering, is it just po a poetic like dream or can it actually be like this 
Yeah. So I think there's um, yeah, because it sounds like poetry when you speak about it, right? It's, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, and it feels like it too, you know. And and it's like, and that's why I think I'm so fascinated by one to one relationship, romantic relationship, because it's like mm-hmm. it's kind of like if I can do it there, okay. All it is is it's, it's extrapolating the essence of that and now expanding it to add more complexity. Right. More people, so you would need to nail it there it. first. Like you need to have. I mean, I, I think it's a good testing ground. I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Um, you know, mm. and I do think that there are differences, but it, it does give me a, it does give me a good sense. And I, and I like that you, you brought up the organization because I think the organization is the modern day tribe. You know, it is actually a tribe, right? Mm-hmm. You know, businesses are tribes, right? They're just, they're tribes that compete in the marketplace. I mean, original tribes competed for resources. They also compete for resources. They're just financial ones, you know, and they compete mm-hmm. with other tribes. Um, and so looking at evolving the structure of the of, of, a, of an organization you know is is one way to start testing the the level of development that's required in order to hold these higher order structures and it's like the individuals inside need to hold a certain level of development and then the the structure of the organism needs to be able to carry that too you know and that, like you said it's a complex thing it's not an easy yeah. it's not an easy task you know and it's like it's we're not the only ones looking at this there are lots of people who are fascinated by this inquiry and are looking into how do we develop these yeah. things you know and it's like the organization is one landscape of which we can explore that and then draw that into and there are people exploring it in the tribal landscape on the community in the land in that kind mm-hmm. of form as well and it's there's going to be overlap between the two and i actually think more than likely the community is going to need some kind of representative organizational structure to continue to compete in the global Probably, marketplace yeah. as it also supports you itself. You know, we're getting pragmatic here. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. just foolish. Uh, the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for that. I think oh, there, was just, there was just one, there yeah. was one, one little thought that I wanted to finish on there. So it's like the, the question was where do men sit when, where do men as men sit inside of that? And that's kind of like, we're building this, this kind of tapestry of what it looks like. And so it was like, if we have a collective of highly individuated beings, all the beings, the men and the women, you know, all have, you know, equal, equal opportunity really, but it's beyond equal opportunity. The notion of equal opportunity doesn't, it's like when it's embodied in a collective, the idea of equal opportunity becomes a bit ludicrous. It's like, of course, like, duh, like, why wouldn't you have that, right? Then I think we will find that there are certain, I'm I'm hesitant to say, like, I almost wanted to say there are certain places where men would be drawn to represent themselves and women would be, but I'm, in terms of the actual function of the of the organism, I don't even know if we would find that. I think we would find people find their position that just suits them as a unique individual being. I do imagine that ritual is going to be important. I do imagine that, you know, we we will need to bring back the the kind of experience of of the transitions from boyhood into teenage into adulthood. Like these kind of processes are going to be yeah, very yeah. important. Yeah. But I I also imagine that the there will be a fluidity to that landscape to that environment that's probably beyond our ability to fully conceive right now you know the 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 level of freedom and it's like and that's again the postmodernism where they where i feel like this kind of this green meme the postmodern movement you know the what we're seeing in that landscape social activism and trans rights and all of that stuff what they get right is the the right to discover your own expression is really valuable and that um there's there's a freedom about that but where they get it wrong is there's an there's almost an imposition of what that's going to look like so it's like if you if you actually take away the imposition and actually allow the freedom within the yeah exactly you allow the freedom within the structure of like and given your biologic biology given your place in inside of masculine feminine dynamics and the fact that that a man and a woman to relate need of masculine feminine polarity otherwise you have a neutral relationship with no sexuality or romance or spark in it you just don't right and when you apply masculine feminine polarity to romantic relationships you get rocket fuel you get something that actually creates incredible generative potential yeah it's like once you understand that the 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 male role inside of that and then you know the male 
the way that the masculine and feminine lead, you know, male leadership is very outward, linear, structured, directed. Female leadership is very subtle behind the scenes, interwoven, non-rational, non-linear, right? And you're kind of bringing the left and right hemispheres together like that and you go recognizing that actually the left and right hemisphere work together. You don't just go, let's just shove them together and make one thing, you know? Then I think we start to get a sense of like, it's like a free expression to discover who we are as men within the context of an integral journey of what it's like to include yeah. all aspects of men throughout time. Yeah, I think the way I hear you is that true unity doesn't mean that you wash out all of the differences and make make everyone yeah. homogenous. True, true unity yeah. actually means that you genuinely accept the differences. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I think... Um, in terms of the particular heterosexual man, woman, masculine, feminine crucible, that is more true than anywhere. That yeah. Yeah, that absolutely. is the differences accepted, loved, and empowered that actually creates the unity. And yeah. and one of the one of the features of like how you stop fighting in a relationship like with a woman is to accept that she's different than you. Of course. You realize she's not going to be the same as you. You can stop fighting for half of the damn things you fight about. It's like she's just never going to be the same. And that's good. It's a good thing, not a bad yeah, thing. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pay attention, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think we're, uh, we're starting to um, approach the end of this conversation, Damien. I've, uh, I've loved yeah. catching up with you. At, yeah, me too. What do you, what do you love about being a man in 2023? Hmm. It's like I think I'm I think I want to answer just like what do I love about being a man without the without the the date stamp on it if that's Fair right enough. with you. That's absolutely yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, the more the more I embrace the the masculine parts of me, the more I embrace kind of the the linear, purposeful, directed way that I want to leave legacy in the world. The more I accept that that's actually a drive inside of me. You know, as an entrepreneur, mm. that this is important to me that I, that I have a direction and I want to move in that direction. You know, it's like, it's been a long journey to actually accept that that's real for me. And I want that, you know, there's a lot of shame that has had to be transmuted and a lot of self-acceptance to be like, actually I care and I want to go somewhere and I want to do something and I want to leave something behind, you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a very masculine thing to want that. Yeah. And the more that I accept my masculinity in my relationship, you know, I've started exploring in my personal relationship with stepping into more prov provision where mm. I'm exploring with my partner. Like she's in a transition from one entrepreneurial endeavor to another and there's one's falling apart and her income is in a hazy space. And I've said to her, um, I'll, t I'll cover the rent. I'm just going to cover the rent from now. And while you transition, and so I'm exploring provision, what it's like to just be like, I'm going to take care of the structure. Mm. And there's something like, whoa, I feel it has me even more driven. You know, it actually mm. like it's, the, you know, in the past that would have freaked the hell out of me, but now it actually has me go, I'm even more driven and my, I'm expanding. My capacity to earn is jumping as a result. It's like, it's wild, the, the, the correlation, you know? And when I, when I touch the places where she's spinning and I go up and I just hold her and she melts, you know, and I don't always get it right. You know, the more that I feel these things that I feel is quite like as masculine. And when I'm present to her, we went out to the bathhouse, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago and I decided there were like women around in their bikinis and everything. And I'm just like, I'm actually going to be really present to her. And I'm, I've been exploring, like not being pulled into kind of validating hits with, with other women, you know, it's like, no, how do I actually not, my attention taken from me Very good. and i yeah. remained present to her the entire time and i could feel women trying to take my attention you know they're almost glitches women when they can't control a man's attention <laughs> yeah 
it does you know like yeah. it's like they go, if they're used to getting those hits it's like why can't i get this man's attention you know it's like mm. no i'm actually devoted to my woman you know it's mm. like she has my attention mm. again a very masculine thing the more i develop all of that it's like the more i actually just love myself you know yeah. so it's like what do i love about being a man it's like the more i embrace myself as a man the more I, and masculine the more i love myself this is actually what i love about being monogamous yeah personally yeah. Yeah that I get to rest my attention on one place instead of scatter it. Cause there's always yeah, opportunity, yeah. you know, like, Oh, she's fit. She's fit. I just, yeah, yeah. I yeah. just, you know, it, it wasn't a long journey that I had with more open relationship and I found it to be miserable, but the, the <laughs> monogamous focus on one woman and not having like any interest in expanding yeah. from that, I find to be profoundly, integrative in some way and and i i like myself more as a result yes yes i i completely agree and i feel more powerful you know and my capacity in the world is increasing as a result the yeah. more i narrow my focus in on her the more her love nourishes me and the more yes. powerful and feedback my impact loop. and reach yeah, yeah 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 very powerful amazing feedback loop yeah yeah i have just i have just one more question for you before we wrap it up damien and that is yeah. If if there was if you had a guy or a group of men and you could get them to do one thing, adopt a habit, change a change a belief system, whatever it was, and you you, you would have a hundred percent implementation of that, mm. what would that be? To have them improve their lives. I think it would be just the, the thing that we actually just spoke about then actually is to become a master of their own attention. Mm. So to 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 have choice about where your attention goes is your attention going into your purpose you know to to not be like looking for the hit the fix the opportunity to actually be in choice and control around mm. your attention in your life and realizing that as a man your attention and your presence is a gift it's an asset it's a precious commodity you know and and if you if you if you masturbate that and you give that away for free you're actually giving away one of your best resources for free yeah. you know you you know so you learn to master your own attention yeah. and and direct it and put it where you want it mm. fantastic yeah. i like that a lot where can yeah. people find out more about you and what you're up to these days yeah they can check out my website evolutionaryrelating.org one word it's currently going through some upgrades. I don't know when this will air, so it may or may not have had them. Actually, it's probably not until mid-year where that's happening. Um, you can go to a contact form there and and get a, sign up to email list. You know, I'm still building my list um, and there are different options for different kind of information you might be interested in around what, what I'm offering currently. Hmm. Um, so that's one place, you know, if you want to be really close to in the loop of what I've got offering, offering, you know, the offerings that I put on the discounts that I do with those things. I've got a lot of interesting launches coming this year. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Evo relating one word, and also follow me on Facebook, Damien Boller, B-O-H-L-E-R. You know, those are the kind of places where I'm got my attention right now. We'll be expanding, but that's where I'm currently at. Amazing. Yeah, thank you for being a guest on the Wayshowers podcast, Damien. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me first. I hope you got a ton out of this conversation with Damien. I know that I really enjoyed it. And I did find a lot of clues as to the next steps that we need to take as men and as a collective of men. If you want to follow up with Damien and his work, you can follow him on Facebook where he offers fairly regular teachings, profound teachings on intimacy relationships. You can also go to his website evolutionaryrelating.org to sign up to his newsletter or indeed join one of his trainings. I'm really grateful that you chose to join Damien and I today and I would also appreciate if you enjoyed this episode to share it with your friends so that they can partake in Damien's wisdom and so that I can get a boost in time for my next episode, which I promise is also going to be an inspiring one. So I hope to see you then and I wish you a great day.